The Tolkien Road, Episode 186, Second Age Deep Dive, The Mariner's Wife, Part 3. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, Episode 186, Second Age Deep Dive. We are continuing with Aldarion and Arendis, The Mariner's Wife, Part 3 now. So welcome in. Greta, welcome to hey. you. Hey, thanks. Welcome to you too. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome as well. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Yeah. Everyone welcome. You're welcome to be welcome. Yes. All are welcome. Oh, yeah. No, you didn't. Sorry. Sorry. Why? I'll, I'll just, I'll cut that out later. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what's up everybody? Uh, back after a week off. So... We're continuing with The Mariner's Wife, Aldarion and Arendis from Unfinished Tales. This is all part of our grand Second Age Deep Dive. We've been on for a while now, learning more and more, reading a lot of new stuff that um, we weren't super familiar with before. Yeah. And and this story is something I had never read before. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, you know, it's one of those stories that's in there. And, you know, there's there's just so many things from Tolkien. And, and this one, just by title alone... And, and setting and everything did not have any connection to anything else that I was already mm. super familiar with. Okay. But what's interesting is that, especially in this week's section, you start to see how it's connected to the greater overall story of Middle Earth, right? Yes. It starts yes. to become a lot more apparent. So that's exciting. It is. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, but before we dive in, uh, just want to remind everybody, if you want to become a patron of the Tolkien Road podcast, you can head on over to patreon.com. Do not forget to pledge one dollar or more per episode, and you can set a monthly limit when you do it. So uh, we would appreciate anything you can give, and um, and if you want to give a whole lot, that's wonderful. If you want to give just a little, that's great too. But we appreciate whatever it is. So indeed, uh, thank you, thank you to our current patrons, especially. Yes. yes, thank you, and and to our past patrons as well. And uh, if our past patrons should choose to come back, we would. Uh, we would love that. We would welcome them so, with open arms. We we welcome all patrons. We're just feeling welcoming we today. We're feeling especially welcoming. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if there's like something in the air or something. It's, it's an unusual. I mean, not that we're unwelcoming, I don't think, but maybe it's because we were off a week. Maybe we're just happy to be back. Maybe it's just, yeah, it's just like the magic word today welcoming. Welcoming. You are all welcome. Yes, so you're welcome over on Patreon, and uh, you get bonus material over there. Um, been a little slow on the bonus material lately, but hopefully that I'm going to take a turn on that here uh, in the next couple of weeks or a couple of months. Just been just been busy with other work and stuff like that. Hadn't been able to devote enough as much time as I'd like to to um, to my my Tolkien endeavors. But hopefully that going to take a turn on that here in the next few months. So. Um, Rate us on iTunes also. That's the that's the way. If you can't support us financially, you can support us by rating us on iTunes. And, um, hey, if you got something nice to say about us and you want to let the world know about it, that that's a great place to do it. Um, you know, you can do that on the social medias, all that kind of stuff, Facebook, Twitter. But when you do it on iTunes, it makes a big difference. And um, so and it, and it gives us a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling when you do that. Yes. Say nice stuff about us. Yeah, warm so. fuzzies. Where it's at, and um, and especially because every once in a while somebody leaves us like a you know negative comment over there, and we like it when we read the positive comments <laughs> yes. a lot more. So, um, but we love to hear from you also at Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail dot com. We will have a mailbag episode soon. I know we've we've been getting some more and more mail for Aldarion and Arendis as well as other topics. So once we have finished with Aldarion and Arendis, we'll likely do another mailbag episode, and so you can send. You can send your email over to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. That's the surest way to make sure we get it. And you can also contact us through the website if you'd like to do that as well. And then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, SpeakPipe, don't forget about SpeakPipe. You can send voicemail to us. And uh, if you do that, you get heard on the next episode. So Skip the line. Skip the line. Mm -hmm. Head of the line privileges. All right. So quick announcements before we dive into this week's ep uh, topic. So uh, we'll be taking uh, – next week we'll take off. So it'll be two weeks until our next episode. So our next episode should drop on – let's see. That'll be the 24th of February. Um, 
And but in the meantime, there's there's no shortage of things you could do if you're hungry for some Tolkien Road, right? So number one is if you've already listened to all the episodes, you can go back and listen to old episodes, right? Because it really, that's not number one. There's actually other things I want to say that are number one, but that's something you can do. If uh, you just need some more Tolkien road, there is, um, there are 186 episodes, including Dang. this one, actually really more than that. Cause I've got all my chapters of my books on there too. So, I mean, really, like, that's a lot of episodes, and you can probably find some that you've completely just, like, forgotten about and discover the wonders and riches that are buried within that episode. Um, so there's that. But what I really want to recommend you do is you go check out a couple of podcasts that um, that one or both of us were guests on recently. So uh, I just received word from our friends at the Card Talk podcast that our episode with them has dropped oh. that we recorded back in December. Fantastic. Um, from our, our, our pal David Walsh over there. And he, uh, so you can actually watch that on YouTube um, and you can see us, right? Because it was a video recording too. And I think they've, they've, so they've got a podcast feed if you're a podcast person, but they've also got the video to watch over on YouTube if you want to see us in all of our glory. Oh, so I didn't know about that piece. You, you, yeah, you did. Oh, I did. Maybe I forgot. You Oh, now, now I now remember. Now David's going to feel bad. No, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Sorry. Don't feel bad, David. I, I am remembering now. Yeah. So. That was, that's right. That was fun that we got to see everybody. It was. It yeah. was. And so that's over there on YouTube and you can watch that. Uh, you can go over there and watch that. And it's a really cool introduction because we didn't know a lot about the Lord of the Rings card game. Mm-mm. So you can go over there and learn more about that. And I encourage you to subscribe to that podcast because they talk about you know, Tolkien stuff because it's a card pot. It's a podcast based upon the Lord of the Rings card game. So I just subscribed while you were saying that. See, it was that easy, that easy. She just whipped out her phone and she was I like, did. ka-ching Boom. subscribed. Yeah. yeah. And now and she got the nice little check mark, you know, and made her, made her feel good about herself. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. The check mark. What is it about that check mark? I know. Now you should, it's now you so should leave good. them a five star rating. I totally will. So, I'm looking for our episode. I'm wondering what they what it was named. The other one is um, is I did a two part interview on the Bellator Colloquium Bellator Colloquium <laughs> Bellator Colloquium podcast um, on Leaf by Niggle, and it was actually spaced over the course of a couple of different. Um, you know, it was act- we did it in segments that were spaced by a couple of months, but uh, you can go listen to that two part interview over on the Bellator Colloquium podcast. And I uh, encourage you the same thing. Subscribe to it. Um, leave them a five star rating. And we have a great discussion on Leaf by Nickel. All right. That was just a little, a little <laughs> taste of, of the card talk oh, intro music. A little teaser. A little teaser. For the card talk podcast. I was just trying to open up our, uh, I just wanted to see the little blurb about our episode and I hit the wrong button. Oh, Sorry. no, you totally did that on purpose. Maybe I did. The dramat- cue the dramatic music for Guest the card host. talk podcast. Tolkien Road podcast. There we are. That's right. We're part of the couple's February theme. So that's super fun. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, so th- that's what you can do when you don't have a new episode to listen uh, to listen to from us next week. Yeah, I need to listen to those Bellator episodes. Yeah, you do. I do. Yeah. I love me some Leaf by Niggle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really do. Like, I just adore the story Leaf by Niggle. It, I realized a few weeks a few weeks ago that it was... It, it it can't it can't really rival the Middle Earth like it can't really rival Lord of the Rings. Nothing really can rival Lord of the Rings, but it's easily my favorite non Middle Earth work of Tolkien, and it rivals a lot of the lesser Middle Earth works. You know, uh, it's just such an incredible story, and I could talk about it endlessly. And I love talking about it with other people who are less familiar with it, and just having a lot of fun doing it and discovering all this richness yes. that's contained therein. I just learned something new about that podcast, that uh, sh- that story every time I read it. So anyway, go listen to uh, Bellator Colloquium and, and my discussion of Leaf by Nagel over there. So there you go. You got you got three roughly hour long episodes of uh, of at least me and with Card Talk me and Greta to listen to next week when we're not around. So do it, do it, and uh, subscribe and support those podcasts. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about Aldarion and Arendis. Uh, yeah, let's. Continuing with the Mariner's Wife. 
we've we're on part three now of our discussion, and this is gonna this is gonna end really the the main part of the narrative that we have. It actually Tolkien never finished this story, hence it's part of the book Unfinished Tales. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of no- so there, there will be at least one more episode we do on this because there's a lot of. Um, notes supplied at the end by Christopher that kind of sketches out how the story probably would have gone. And um, we do plan to talk about that on the next episode we do. And and it might end up taking actually two parts to do that. So we'll see. And anyway, this is the last part that we have. And it really starts to kind of pick up pace, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, So there's, it just to refresh, there's three key themes of the Second Age, according to Tolkien. The first is the delaying elves. The second is Sauron's growth to a new Dark Lord, and the third is Numenor. This is this story has really been completely focused on Numenor, with a little bit of like kind of in the background. You know, we have the elves that are still in Middle Earth, the delaying elves, but we haven't heard a lot about Sauron. There's a little note that that it didn't ever mention Sauron, but that there was some kind of a new Dark Lord or a new Dark Presence that was growing in Middle Earth. Um, but then we actually hear a lot more about it in this in uh, in the reading this week. So, um, just background real quick on Aldari- Aldarion. He is the sixth king of Numenor, and and then his wife Arendis is the uh, is his wife and the mother of the the seventh monarch of Numenor, who the future monarch of Numenor, and who will be the first queen, uh, ru- ruling queen of Numenor. Right. So. Um, and that is um, uh, Ancalame. So when we left off last time, Aldarion leaves for sea again and is gone longer than expected. It's, it's the story of his life. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. and then Arendis moved to the sheeplands of Amarie with Ancalame because she can't stand the sight of trees or the sea anymore. And, and really not men, apparently, anymore either. So right. yep. um, she's just been so, I guess, hurt by Aldarion that she just... She's bitter, and and sh- and she applies this bitterness towards all men, and she has this mm-hmm. kind of weird resolution not to let her daughter warm to any man. Right. Right. Yep. So, uh, not there's really no men around uh, in this place where they live, and that's where we left off. Quick synopsis of this week's episode before we dive into the details and the discussion. So, it starts off with Ancalame and this boy. It's this episode. This like weird little episode with yeah, Alcalame and this yeah, boy. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, and then we get Aldarion's return, finally, and his meeting with his father, Tarman Eldor, the king, the, the present king of Numenor. And then uh, after that, Aldarion meets with Erendis, and he sees Alcalame after he hasn't seen her for about six years. Um, then Aldarion gives a red jewel to the wife of Olbar, another kind of strange little episode, didn't really know what to make of that entirely. And... Um, and then Meneldor reads a dire letter from Gilgalad. So Aldarion had brought with him a letter from the Gilgalad, uh, the the high elf king of the Noldor back in Middle Earth, and not even not even Aldarion had read this, right? So he gives it to it was it was for the king's eyes only, right? So he gives it to Tarman Eldor, and we get Tarman Eldor's reading of that, and then his reaction to that. Uh, Meneldor has a Hamlet moment. He does have a Hamlet moment. I realized that. Yeah, this morning I was, was like reading it, it, and I was like, "This sounds kind of familiar." Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. And then Aldarion names the white elven tree for Ancalame, and Tar Meneldor abdicates for Aldar- Aldarion and informs the council, and and then Arendis refuses to return to, for the coronation of her husband, uh, Aldarion. So yeah. that's okay. the synopsis. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we talked about on column A and the boy. What did you make of this little episode here? I, I didn't really completely understand how this fit into the rest of the the narrative. Yeah, same, same. I was, uh, it it kind of made me wonder. Like I kept thinking it was going to come back, you know, like that it would be tied back in, and then I realized, oh wait, this tale was never finished. So I wonder if that was something that Tolkien had planned to expand upon. Mm-hmm. You know, and make more of or or uh, revisit, yeah, and just didn't didn't get there, but um just for this little part, <clears throat> excuse me, um I think mainly it just shows like it's a way to illustrate just how embittered um horrendous has become toward all members of the male species, yes. And has passed that along to her daughter. 
um, or at least is, is trying to. Just like that's to how she's being. Yeah. That's how she's being raised. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to make a connection because I realized after you know you get all these new names with this story, and so it can be it can be a little disorienting. But you, I started to make the connection that this boy was the son of Olbar, and right. who Olbar. There's another weird episode in the middle of the story, in the middle of this week's reading, where I'm trying to find it here, but it's after 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 Aldarion visits Arendis, he leaves, but he's still in the Sheeplands, and he goes to visit his cousin, who is where is this? I need to find the actual reference here. And here also, we go. Oh, okay, uh, go let ahead. me say this. Okay, so. Um, he goes to visit Halaton, his cousin, um, and it goes to rest there when he's leaving a, a little later uh, with uh, from seeing Arendis. And Olbar, who is the father of this boy, is one of the men who's on the voyage with him. And it does mention that in the episode we're referring to. But then it, it mentions the boy. He says... Um, the boy says, I would but ask, how old must a man be before he may go over sea in a ship yes. like my father? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So this boy comes up again later in the story. Still and then and then there is the thing with Aldarion giving the red the jewel yeah. to his mother and to Olbar's wife. Right. And right? Olbar is out at sea with Aldarion at this point. At, at correct? This, at this point when the when the boy comes and visits on Kalame. So both of those children on Kalame and what was the boy's name? Uh, I think it's is e- Ebal or Ebal, yeah. Ebal. So both of them have essentially been abandoned by their fathers, right? Yeah. For the sea, at least for the time being. So, um, and then, like you just mentioned, Ebal clearly has this hankering to get to the sea. Like he's right. So it shows that he's kind of following in his dad's footsteps, where. Um, uh, uh, what's the daughter's name? Oh yeah, here we go. It says, but then suddenly Olbar cried out, the great captain and Ebal, his son, ran forward to Aldarian stirrup. Lord captain, he said eagerly. Right. Yeah, so he's, you know, it, it's, it seems that at least Tolkien is hinting at the fact that this Ebal is going to father in, follow in his father's footsteps, mm-hmm. wanting to be a mariner, right? And here, um, or what's the babe, the girl's name? Ancalame. Ancalame. Yeah is being raised basically to hate men. Mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, like, I kind of wonder if this might be, and this just totally came to me and I might be way off base, but I wonder if Tolkien had a mind to maybe Ebal and Ancalame, Mm -hmm. if they might be the second generation of Arendis and Alderion. Well, there's actually, so uh, let me say spoiler spoiler alert real quick, because I'm going to talk about, who on Kalame ends up marrying later. Oh, okay. so if, if you, if you go to the very end, let's, let's use your copy. So I don't have to lose my place on my iPad here. Okay, sure. Lose um, my place. That's fine. No, I'm not losing your mm-hmm. place. It's just easier to mark it. Okay. All right. So we'll put this here. Bookmark. <laughs> okay. All right. So you have Aldarion and Arendis and then on Kalame and, and she marries Halakar, which is, the son of Halatan, right? Which is that's his cousin. He's going to visit that. Oh, that he's going to visit. So she marries like her second cousin. No, it's not second cousin. It's like let's see. It would be. I mean, it's there. So there. Um, so Aldarion's one, one, two, three. So Aldarion's great grandfather, great grandfather's sibling was Halatan's great grandparent right okay. so it's going back like four generations so that's like several like okay you know that that's not like i mean it's, okay. it's still weird to like for most people to think of marrying someone who's marrying like within a, the family even a distant relative, at some point but, yeah um but that's not like a like whoa you right know? not like super close related yeah and, and that's pretty common amongst like yeah. in like kind of not like monarchical right yeah royal royal, royal families you know, royal yes. families and that kind of thing yes i get that so i was wrong but anyway yeah no well it was a good theory i actually yeah, thought I that too and that's theory. why i looked okay that's why i looked i wasn't the, saying it wasn't good theory i was just saying i was wrong but but it but it is related to Hol- so holoton's son ends up becoming the the husband of 
on column A. On column A. Right. Got uh, it. Okay. Aldarion's daughter. Right. Okay. So, um, so there is a connection there, but it's still interesting that, uh, and I don't, I don't know if this boy will figure into the story somehow later, um, but he does pop up a couple of times. So anyway, um, so yeah, we have this weird episode, um, and with the boy and maybe that'll come into greater clarity as to why this is important later on. But we do get that a little later. And this is six years after he left, after saying he'd be gone for two, um, Aldarion returns, right? He finally returns. Yeah. I was just going to say, I just realized too, that maybe the point of that little vignette between the Mm -hmm. boy and the girl, it it brought to mind, it it brought to, um, I can't remember her name, and Colomay's mind, Mm -hmm. like, oh, I must have a father. Right. Right? Because I think well, she would have only been like three or so, mm-hmm. right, when her dad left. And here, here she's been raised with only women around her for the last several years. And all of a sudden this boy shows up and they get to talking, you know. And so it somehow comes up. Like it, it, it causes Ancalame to ask Arendis about her dad. That is true. It does say no word concerning Aldarion had passed between them before. So it brings him back up and right. maybe serves to fuel Arendis's bitterness even more mm-hmm. um and also reminds on column a, oh yeah i do have a dad well and you also see this boy she meets this boy who's doesn't seem to be terribly troubled that her that his father has been gone for no six he's years. not bothered at all about it right no mm-mm. so and neither does we'll see neither does his mom like his mom doesn't seem bothered by the fact that her husband's been gone for the past six years either yeah i mean she scored big she gets a nice big she red gets a nice big, exactly i, I know mean, right it's pretty sweet it is. But of course, we don't know. This could have been his first voyage. It right? could have been. That's so, true. Um, maybe he didn't have the history that Aldarion did. But anyway. So so Aldarion does return. And uh, upon his return, he, of course, goes to meet with the king, his father, Tarman Eldor. And, um, and they have a little kind of cold conversation, as you might expect. And Eldor has never really been happy about Aldarion's being away, his heir being away. Uh, for long periods of time at sea. He doesn't understand the lure of the sea at all. And um, so they kind of have this back and forth, and Aldarion gives him a letter, right? Aldarion mm-hmm. gives him a letter and is like, here's this letter I'm supposed to give to you. Um, let's see, can I find that part? And right before that, and the, their first order of business, though, is basically Maneldor is chiding him. Right. Like, basically, why are you here and not... Why have you not seen your wife yet? And it, bas- it basically says he speaks to him not like you know, as a king to a captain whose conduct is in question, right? Right, exactly. He, he's not, not like, welcome home, my It's son. not a warm welcome. Yeah. No. Um, but so, yeah, then as Aldarion's going to leave, right. he's like, oh, wait, I have this letter for you. Well, and he says, um, the world is, Aldarion says to his father, the world is changing again. Outside and I on a thousand years have passed since the lords of the West sent their power against Angband, and those days are forgotten or wrapped in dim legend among men of Middle Earth. They are troubled again and fear haunts them. I desire greatly to consult with you to give account of my deeds and my thought concerning what should be done. Meneldor responds, You shall do so. Indeed, I expect no less. But there are other matters which I judge more urgent. Let a king first rule well his own house, ere he correct others, it is said. It is true of all men. I will get. I will now give you counsel, son of Meneldor. You have also a life of your own. Half of yourself you have ever neglected. To you I say now, go home. So, uh, and and then he does hand him uh, he does hand him the letter, and mm-hmm. we don't actually find out what that letter says right now. But then Aldarion goes from there to, uh, you know, to visit to see Arendis, right? right. Mm-hmm. Um, does it mention here that he goes? Does he go first to the home where they used to live before Arendis moved? Um, that may not be important. I don't think he. I, I don't think so. Yeah, it just says riding hard they came to Amari at nightfall the next day, and men and horses were weary. So, um, he goes, visits Amarie, I'm sorry, uh, visits Arendis in Amarie, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it goes about how you might expect it to go as well, right? She is not exactly happy to see him, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, she has grown very bitter. She's grown very cold. It says, Arendis would have withheld on from meeting, from meeting, 
Aldarion at this time, but, but she feared to go so far as to lose the king's favor, and the council had long shown their displeasure at the upbringing of the child in the country. Therefore, when Aldarion rode back, which uh, Hinderic beside, with Hinderic beside him, Ancalame stood beside her mother on the threshold. Uh, I'm actually jumping ahead just a little bit, so I don't know mm-hmm. if there was anything before that you wanted to mention. But this is just, you know, he basically, he wants to see his daughter, right? And mm-hmm. Arendus is not really forthcoming with allowing him to see Ancalame, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I just, I didn't highlight a lot here in the Arendus and Aldarion's conversation because it's just, it's more of like how they've been. Right. It's kind of more of the same, but I think, um, I feel like it's gone to a new level. It has. Here. And that's maybe the thing to highlight is that, well, I mean, you, you want to explain? No, I was, yeah, I was just going to, my, my thought was just that, you know, I mean, it's kind of. I think Aldarion's comment, and after they've had their exchange, he said, I was told in Ar- Armine- Ar- how do you say it? Armenelos? Armenelos. Armenelos. Armenelos, that my wife was here and had removed my daughter hither. As to the wife, I am mistaken, it seems. But have I not a daughter? So it's like he doesn't even, like they're, it's to the point now where it's not even like there's really that marital bond right. at all. He's like, well, I thought my wife was here, but clearly I was mistaken. Yeah. So it's almost, I mean, it's it's like, yeah, it's like they were never even married. And in the past, when he's come back and she's, you know, she's been pretty, I mean, there's been a lot of cases where she's been pretty bitter mm-hmm. at him, but, but they've been able they to do, reconcile. They do reconcile right. to some degree. Right. But before there was always like betrothal and, and a wedding and, you know, and, and these sorts of things. And, but now they're married and they have a daughter and he's been gone four years longer than mm-hmm. he said he would be. Right. 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 So, and I can understand. I mean, as a woman, I can yeah. understand Arendis's reaction here. I don't think if I were in her shoes, I don't think I'd be very happy either. Yeah. But I would like to think that I would at least be willing to try for the sake of my child. Yeah. To not completely alienate my husband. Yeah. The, the, they're both just very strong personalities. Mm-hmm. Like they very. Are. Yeah. I don't know if pride is the white is the right word, but stubborn, definitely. But but both, yeah, just stubborn, like yeah. really stubborn personalities, yeah. mm-hmm. and with opposite desire. You know, that's probably not a recipe for a happy. Marriage. No, it's not at all. Not I mean, at all. you know, you and I both have our moments of stubbornness, but uh, but we all, you know, we always we always warm up to each other. You know, again, um, sometimes quicker than usual, but yeah, or sometimes quicker well, and than I think other that's times, probably true but, of most of most marriages sure but um, i think a marriage if people tell you that like they never fight with their spouse they're lying yeah like oh, totally. totally yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean you think that i mean even in you know the worst moments especially if there are children involved you would like to be able to rise you, you know it seems like let's just rise above mm-hmm. and even though it's hard to take that first step you know I think pride may be the right word because neither one of them is willing to take that first step. Right. And be like, I'm sorry. You know, Aldarion's not willing to apologize for being gone longer than mm-hmm. he was. And she's not willing, you know, Rendis isn't willing to, to cut him any slack. I mean, it could be, it could be that there was very good reason for him being delayed. Right. He could have been doing some really good stuff. Well, we we find out that maybe there was. Maybe right? there was that, exactly. Um, but they weren't. That never even comes up. Yeah. Like they don't even give each other the chance to explain. Mm-hmm. You know, which is, just makes me sad. I mean, do you think that Aldarion could have maybe poured on the the sugar a little a little more? He, like, yes, I think so. But I think it just by her initial by her responding, just just her probably her body language and the way that she even approached him. Just was like, she was probably a little scary. Yeah. You know? I mean, it probably took, if he even went there with that intent, like, oh, I'm, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to pour the sugar on. I think just one glance at her, he'd been like, ooh, never mind. Yeah. (laughs) I'm scared. So I think she could have behaved in a way that maybe would have made him more willing or, you know, maybe more, um, more apt to to be more loving toward her, but she probably gave off the vibe that she just wanted nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. And in that case, especially for a prideful individual, I think it's really hard to put yourself out there like that. 
when the other person is clearly giving off the stay away from me signals, you know? Exactly. Yeah. But so, yes, I think he could have, but I think she probably made it very difficult for him to want to. Yeah. No, I agree. I I think, I think that's spot on. I mean, he says, he says, I was told in Arminellos that my wife was here and had removed my daughter hither. Mm -hmm. Um, I just read that. Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm just reiterating, Uh you know. um, So make sure you were listening to me. So it's like he did come like hoping to see her and and Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure he came like expecting like, boy, I'm going to be in the doghouse for a long time, but Mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, I can see what you're saying. Like she, she she seems like she's giving off a vibe of just like, yeah, you're, you know, you're You're done. You're done. Yeah. I want nothing to do with you. Go away. I mean, and she's already sent that message by not even, you know, by just removing herself and her, her daughter to the country. Yet. And yet I think there is a hopeful moment for, for Aldarion late in this particular section that uh, unfortunately kind of proves just how bitter Arendis is. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll get to that in just a moment. So it, it does, um, he does manage to see his daughter before he leaves from Amaria here. It says Arendis would have withheld on Kalame from meeting him at that time, but she feared to go so far as to lose the king's favor and the council had long shown their displeasure at the upbringing of the child in the country. Therefore, when Aldarion rode back with Hen- uh, Hinderk beside him on Kalame stood bef- beside her mother on the threshold. She stood erect and stiff as her mother and made him no courtesy as he dismounted and came up the steps towards her. Who are you? She said, and why do you bid me to rise so early before the house is stirring? Aldarion looked at her keenly and though her face was stern, he smiled within for he saw there a child of his own rather than a Verendus for all her schooling. You knew me once lady on Kalame, he said, but no matter. Today, today I am but a messenger from Armenelos to remind you that you are the daughter of the king's heir. And so far as I can now see, you shall be his heir in your turn. You will not always dwell here, but go back to your bed now, my lady, until your maidservant wakes, if you will. I am in haste to see the king. Farewell. He kissed the hand of Ancalame and went down the steps. Then he mounted and rode away with a wave of his hand. Arendus, alone at a window, watched him riding down the hill, and she marked that he rode towards... Chiara Storni and not towards Armenelos. Then she wept from grief, but still more from anger. She had looked for more penitence that she might extend after rebuke, pardon if prayed for. But he had dealt with her as if she were the offender and ignored her bef- before her daughter. Too late she remembered the words of Nuneth long before, and she saw Aldarion now as something large and not to be tamed, driven by a fierce will, more perilous when chill. She rose and turned from the window, thinking of her wrongs. Perilous, she said. I am still hard to break. So he would find even where he, the king of Numenor, foreshadowing. Um, but yeah, you know, it turns out there that she is saying like she 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 was she was hoping that I think Aldarion would like you know she really was actually like, hoping he would pour on the sugar, right? Yeah, but I don't think this is true. It says, but he had dealt with her as if she were the offender. Well, I think maybe we're hearing both of their inner voices in this, right? Like we're okay. hearing something of like what what's going through her mind right yeah um he looks at her and he's like wow she's she's really cold and maybe there's a little part of him that's like it's no use right now i just need to bide my time and she'll warm you know to me but and she's she's doing all this because she wants him to to get on one knee and essentially like propose marriage to her again you know mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. like really i mean it says she feels like, and I think it's, I think it's, I think you can read this as she felt like he had dealt with her as if she were the offender and ignored her before that's her daughter. That's what she felt. Yeah. But I don't, that's not how I read this at all. I feel like she could have, there was nothing in the interaction that made me believe that he just kind of approached her that she was in the wrong. I don't, I don't think that's true. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I mean, it said even his first look at her, she held herself high. Mm -hmm. But as he drew near, he saw that she was pale and her eyes over bright. Um, Well, and I think, again, it just gets back to the stubbornness of of them both, right? Like no one wants to make the first move of reconciliation. No one wants to humble themselves uh, in order to, in order to, you know, to start the process, to begin the process of reconciliation. That's hard. I mean, that is really hard it to is. be the one to take that first step when you feel like you are the one who is completely wronged and the other person was com- 
you know, it was all their fault. It's really hard to make that first step, but like she didn't even go to like have dinner with him, I, right? I feel, and I, then she had the guest room prepared for him. Like she did all these things to make it clear that she that she was done, that she was over it, you know. And then for her to think that he, she was treated as if she were the offender. No, you're the one that refused to have dinner with him. You're the one that made him sleep in the guest room. Like you're the one that had to be begged to let him see his daughter. Like yeah, well, I but ultimately, like I feel. I feel like, he, like he. I think you see later on that he do, he doesn't try hard enough. Like, right? He, like, and and you have to remember, like, he made this bed for himself, right? Like, that's, he's, he he didn't true. have to leave. That's true. He didn't have to leave. He could have at least come back on time, and and he could have at least come back on time, yeah. definitely. But he didn't yeah. have to leave. He didn't even try to be like, look. I know I I know I was gone a lot longer than I ex, than mm-hmm. you expected me to be, mm-hmm. but please understand there was a good reason for it. Right, right? that's true. He Instead of just being like, I was out with the boys hanging out, you know. <laughs> right. Sorry yeah. if I was four years late. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is as far as she knows is all the explanation there is. Right. 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 And and so I do feel like he is the the I I really I do I, I think about it and I and I kind of analyze in my mind I think he is the chief offender here and. And it really is incumbent upon him to be to begin to humble himself and apologize and offer some kind of explanation for why he was gone. Mm-hmm. Try to begin that process of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that that she's completely free of blame, but I think we see later on that that his whole attitude he just has this very haughty attitude towards yeah, towards he everybody. He does. Right? Yeah. And he's like you know, he, he says later on, he's like, I will not just be like, you know, I, would, I don't have the right exact words in front of me, but he says like, I will not just be like the this pet dog for her, you know, mm-hmm. to, to lie down. I'm this, I'm mm-hmm. this great king's heir and I will be mm-hmm. the king one day, right? You know? Yeah. And that's how he views women is like that, that they just want to keep men from the sea, basically. <laughs> like they yeah. want them to just, you know, to tame men and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. So, They're just total buzzkills. Yeah. No, I agree. I think, I think the first step was his to make for sure. But I also think that she, I, I think she, she could, could have made more of an effort. Yeah. You know, and she, she could have made it easier on him. Yeah. Just by little things. But she probably doesn't want to make it too easy because she doesn't want to, doesn't like, want him to keep leaving. Exactly. Yeah. You know? No, I understand. She wants that him to too. feel a sting, you know? Yes, from being away. but I think there's a da- there's a balance there, you know. I mean, and and also like, she never even blows up at him, mm-hmm. you know. Like, there's nothing. Let's 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 just come back to this until the end of the okay m- until the end of this because right. I, I think we, I think we'll on get on back into it at the end, okay. right? With uh, with the way that this section ends. Okay. So we have this. We next we get to this little section with. Um, his stop at the at the home of Olbar, and uh, which we we talked about, and Olbar's son um, Ibal, and I mean I don't have a whole lot more to say about that. I, I'm not sure how this how these episodes fit into the overall arc and what you know are these seeds that are being planted for some future thing with mm-hmm. with Ibal or Olbar's wife or something like that, but. Anyway, it's there, and yeah, I think I think what struck me about that interaction with um, Aldarion giving Olbar's wife the ring was like that's probably something that should have been given to his own wife. That's true, maybe. Yeah, and so that just is kind of shows how 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 like beyond repair. Interesting, I hadn't thought about that, but um, you might be right about that. How beyond repair Aldarion Arendis is, you know, like he didn't even try to give it to her. Probably because he knew she would just throw it back in his face. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I think that's just what struck me. Like, why is he giving it to this woman of his, of his, you know, crew, the the wife of a member of his crew instead of, or even to his daughter, you I, know? I like that. I think, I think you're, I think you're probably spot on with that. That this is some, that the reason this is here is because he had this gift to give to, to Arendis. Mm-hmm. From Gilgalad, and he was just like, "Well, I can't give it to her now. This is not like, yeah, this is she's not going to she's not going to want this, right? She's not going to want this. But I have to give it to somebody. I'm not just going to hang on to this. I wonder why he just didn't save it for his daughter, though. You yeah. know, that just even takes it a step further for me. It's like it's almost like he's well, my family's dead to me, basically. Yeah, maybe the jewel will come back and play at some point. 
Yeah, maybe. Um, good insight. Good insight, Greta. Thanks. Thanks, John. All right. So moving on, we get we come back to Tarman Eldor, and he reads this letter that was given to him by Aldarion. So uh, it says he saw that it came from King Gilgalad and Lindon, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, it was sealed and bore his device of white stars upon a blue rondor. Just just FYI, Lindon is the uh, is the region in Middle Earth where is there a good map in this book? Make sure I, got I this do right. not know. Well, anyway, Lindon is the region where it's the region west of the Misty Mountains. Um, where I believe this is right. I'm gonna I'm gonna double check this just because it's not what I'm used to calling it. So wait, Lindon. Lindon. Okay, that's where King Gilgalad lives. Right. Okay. So this is the realm he rules. A region of the Westlands. Um, uh, Lindon was the name of Assyriand, a region west of the Blue Mountains in eastern Beleriand. After the deluge of Beleriand and the War of Wrath, Lindon became the westernmost land of the continent of Middle Earth. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking. I have, I have it wrong. Lindon is the is the region where let me find a good map i'm getting so mixed up Ugh. um middle I'm, I'm no help when it comes to geography i know i'm like I'm, none. I'm mixing it up with another name that we don't normally use i thought i had it right so i should have looked it up before sorry um just give me a nice <laughs> map let me click around a million times Where's a nice Middle Earth map when you need it? Did you look in here? Is there not one? It's it's they have a map of Numenor. Can you grab oh. can you grab my copy of Return of the King up there mm-hmm. from the bookshelf? Sorry. If I had elevator music, I'd play it right now while you're waiting. It used to be so easy to find a nice image on Google and now they make it so you have to click through a million times to find something. Here you go. We're totes professional people. You know it. All right, here we go. So, yeah. Lindon is Lindon is the region to the west of the Blue Mountains. And I was what was I was thinking of the region west of the Misty Mountains um that once upon a time was it's I was thinking of Eregion um or Holland, but Lindon is the region to the west of the Blue Mountains. It's the place where the Grey Havens is located. Well, not the Grey Havens actually is not located in Lindon, but it's like the the Gulf of Loon, where the Grey Havens, um, where they travel out of, is in. It splits Lindon in half. Lindon in half. So, okay. there you go. Right on. Long little bar on figuring out where the heck we are. But anyway, this is from Gilgalad. This letter is from Gilgalad. Uh, in in Lindon, the Great Elven King. Are you gonna read the whole thing? Well. I was kind of thinking of it. Do you want to read it? No, because I can't pronounce half the words <laughs> in it. All right, here we go. Then Manel Bro- uh it says, Upon the outer fold was written, Given at Mithlon to the hand of the Lord Aldarion, king's heir of Numenore, to be delivered to the high king at Armenelos in person. Then Maneldor broke the seal and read, Erenion Gilgalad, son of Fingon, to Tarmaneldor of the line of Yarendel, greeting The Valar keep you, and may no shadow fall upon the Isle of Kings. Long I have owed you thanks, for you have so many times sent to me your son Anardil Aldarion, the greatest elf friend that now is among men, as I deem. At this time I ask ask your pardon, if I have detained him over long in my service, for I had great need of the knowledge of men and their tongues which he alone possesses. He has dared many perils to bring me counsel. Of my need he will speak to you, yet he does not guess how great it is, being young and full of hope. Therefore I write this for the eyes of the king of Numenor only. A new shadow arises in the east. It is no tyranny of evil men, as your son believes, but a servant of Morgoth is stirring, and evil things awake again. Each year it gains in strength, for most men are ripe to its purpose. Not far off is the day, I judge, when it will become too great for the Eldar unaided to withstand. Therefore, whenever I behold a tall ship of the kings of men, my heart is eased, and now I I make bold to seek your help. If you have any strength of men to spare, lend it to me, I beg. Your son will report to you, if you will, all our reasons. But in fine, it is his counsel, and that is ever wise, that when assault comes, as it surely will, 
we should seek to hold the Westlands, where still the Eldar dwell, and men of your race, whose hearts are not yet darkened. At the least, we must defend Ariador about the long rivers west of the mountains that we name Hithiglir, our chief defense. But in that mountain well, there is a great gap southward in the land of Kalinarthon, and by that way inroad from the east must come. Already enmity creeps along the coast towards it. It could be defended and assaulted and assault hindered did we hold some seat of power upon the nearer shore. So the Lord Aldarion long has seen. At Vinyalande, by the mouth of Guathlo, he has long labored to establish such a haven, secure against sea and land, but his mighty works have been in vain. He has great knowledge in such matters, for he has learned much of Círdan, and he understands better than any the needs of your great ships. But he has never had enough men, whereas Círdan had no rights or masons to spare. The king will know his own needs, but if he will listen with favor to the Lord Aldarion and support him as he may, then hope will be greater in the world. The memories of the first age are dim, and all things in Middle-earth grow colder. Let not the ancient friendship of Eldar and Dunedain wane also. Behold, the darkness that is to come is filled with hatred for us, but it hates you no less. The great sea will not be too wide for its wings if it suffered to come to full growth. Manwe keep you under the one and send fair wind to your sails. What a letter. Quite a letter. Yeah. Yeah. So things are looking pretty perilous in Middle Earth right now, according to Gogolod, and we can, you know, read between the lines and understand that this is Sauron who's, mm-hmm. you know, who is a, uh, you know, Making coming to comeback. power, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, you know, this is really, it's not really his comeback. I mean, he was... Well, true. And, and the reason I say that is because before he was just a servant of Morgoth, right? Right. Okay. But and, now it's, he, he's... And so the shadow is making over. a comeback, but now right. Sauron is the is the he's king the, of the shadow, he's right? He's the commander, yes. Right, whereas Morgoth was once upon a time. Morgoth is gone from the world, but Sauron, who was really his chief servant, mm-hmm. his chief lieutenant um, right. in the first age, is now leading the charge for the shadow. Right. So the right-hand man has become the commander. And Gilgalad is basically saying, like, I don't have... I'm not able to fend this off by myself, and I need right. the help of of Numenor. So, is he saying here, um, like, is he implying that Aldarion knew this was happening? Because it says um, he doesn't. He says Aldarion doesn't know that it's a servant of Morgoth. Like he, okay. he knows that he thinks it's it's um, like bad men, like evil men. I see, and he. It sounds like Aldarion's been working to try and thwart that, right? Because it says that he, he long labored to establish a haven, yeah, secure against sea and land, but his mighty works have been in vain. Right. So he's aware that things are not good, mm-hmm. and that could be why he was detained. It, yeah, and so they you know, they tried to build this um, Vinyalande at it's the mouth of the which is uh, it's the mouth of the Grey Flood River, mm-hmm. and what's what's commonly known more commonly known as the Grey Flood River, right. Uh, which they refer to here as the. Let me get it right here. Uh, uh, do, 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 sorry. Do, do. I'm doing that a lot today. Do, 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 do. What, is the. It's, it begins with an H that we name Hithaglir. Um, our chief. Let's see. We must defend Ariador a lo- about the long rivers west of the mountains that we name Hith- Hithaglir, our chief defense. But in that mountain wall, there is a great gap southward in the land of Kalin Arthon, which is, yeah, this map isn't helping me. Anyway, um, so long story short, Gilgalad needs help. They need help. And, They're not well prepared and asking, for the... And he's asking Meneldor for this. So right. this is where we start to, like Sauron starts to become this presence. And remember, this is like still before... We're still within the first thousand years of Numenor here, at late in the first thousand, late in the first millennium right. of Numenor mm-hmm. of the Second Age. So, you know, there's still a lot of history to go with uh, the Second Age here. So, Meneldor reads this, and it says it let he let the parchment fall into his lap, and uh, great clouds borne upon a wind out of the east brought darkness early, and the tall candles at his side seemed to dwindle in the gloom that filled his chamber. He says, "May Eru call me before such a time comes." He cried aloud. So, um, yeah, he's a religious man. <laughs> God help mm-hmm. me. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. And this is what I referred to early, uh, earlier as his Hamlet moment. Um, 
To prepare or to let it be. Right. I am in too great doubt to rule, to prepare or to let be, Mm -hmm. to prepare for war, which is yet only guessed. Train craftsmen and tillers in the midst of peace for blood spilling and battle. Put iron in the hands of greedy captains who will love only conquest and count the slain as their glory. Will they say to Eru, at least your enemies were amongst them? Or to fold hands while friends die unjustly. Let men live in blind peace until the ravisher is at the gate. What then will they do? Match naked hands against iron and die in vain, or flee, leaving the cries of women behind them. Will they say to Eru, at least I spilled no blood? So, um, you know, he's he's really, yeah, this is his to be or not to be moment. Um, and Meneldor, in the end, does not deem himself up to, to taking it on. On one hand, he's like, you know, I can, we can go to the service here but you know it's going to take this land which has always been a land of peace and turn it into a a realm of war it's going to change it fundamentally but if i don't help then like i'm i'm no friend right and we're really just putting off the inevitable conquest of our own land eventually right because mm-hmm. as gilgalad said you know you may be over there way across the sea but the hatred of this force of the shadow is not uh does not stop at the sea right it comes it comes for you as well so. Right. And this was curious to me, too, and he's kind of thinking out loud. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he says, When either way may lead to evil, of what worth is choice? Let the Valar rule under Eru. I will, re- I will resign the scepter to Eldarion. Mm-hmm. Yet that is also a choice, for I know well which road he will take. Unless Arendis, dot, dot, dot. Mm-hmm. And then it says that he thought about her. And then realize there is little hope there, if it should be called hope. He will not bend in such grave matters. I know her choice. Um, so, I don't. I'm I'm curious what he was thinking about there. Was he wondering if maybe Aldarion would? No, he was thinking, oh, maybe Aldarion will not accept the scepter because he desires to be with Horrendous out in the country. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm just wondering what was what was the consideration there with regards to Horrendous? Yeah. That's a good question, and I hadn't thought about it too deeply. Well, let's read what the next paragraph says. Then Meneldor's okay. thought turned in disquiet to Erendis and Imarie. But there is little hope there, if it should be called hope. He will not bend in such grave matter, in such grave matters. I know her choice, even where she list, even were she to listen long enough to understand. For her heart has no wings beyond Numenor, and she has no guess of the cost. If her choice should lead to death in her own time, she would die bravely. But what will she do with life and other wills? The Valar themselves, even as I, must wait to discover. So part, there's an interesting note there. Because Meneldor is like, why are the, like, why are the lords of the Valar, like, he feels like he's getting mixed messages from the lords of the Valar, right? The From the lords of the West, right? Okay. The Valar, right? Um, we'll come back to that in a second. But, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, I don't completely understand this, what, He's this unless horrendous. He he seems it's inevitable that if he gives the scepter to Aldarion, that he's going to want to help Gilgalad, right? I mm-hmm. mean that that does seem absolutely inevitable. Um. And. Uh. But he says he says even that seems like a choice by myself though because if I do resign it, then, I then I'm basically saying I'm basically choosing for Gil to help Gilgalad, right? Right. Because it's inevitable right. he's going to do that. Unless horrendous, dot, dot, dot. And, and and then he's, maybe he's, yeah, that's the only thing I can think is that maybe he's thinking like, if, maybe if horrendous can talk him out of it as the queen, right? Um, talk him out of helping. Talk Bill him Blood. out of helping. But but he doesn't seem to think that's really reasonable either. So he does will not he not want to help? Like, that's why I'm confused. He's just not, he is not a warrior. Like you go back and you read what he says before and he's like, we were given this land as a reward, as a land of peace. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. When the Valar gave us the land of gift, they did not make us their vice regents. We were given the kingdom of Numenor, not of the world. They are the lords. Here we were to put away hatred and war, for war was ended and and Morgoth thrust forth from Arda. So I deemed and so was taught. So he's just always been raised as this peaceful, as the king of peace, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Um, There was never any indication that there was going to be a need to take up arms again for the people of Numenor, right? Gotcha. He's like, we've always looked to the Lords of the West for protection mm-hmm. in these matters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and he, he says for a moment, like, I wouldn't, 
even think of doing this unless I received a sign from the Lords of the rest of the West. But then he's like, well, maybe this is the sign from the Lords of the West. Right. 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 Um, this note from Gilgalad. It's quite a conundrum. Yeah. So, yeah. but he, he resolves, finally he resolves to, um, to hand the scepter over to Aldarion to resign himself. I wonder if it's, at first I thought it, you know, I kind of read this and I was like, oh, it's very brave of him. I think that's the right call. Mm -hmm. And now I'm wondering if it was just cowardly. I don't know. I I think, yeah, you know, it's, uh, (laughs) of course, we've been watching, we we just finished watching the third season of The Crown, you and I, Mm -hmm. and that, of course, goes into the whole story of, yeah. Uh, of the the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II who abdicated the throne in the 30s and and then gave basically he had no heir he had no children so basically the 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 crown came unexpectedly to his brother mm-hmm. and and then that's how Queen Elizabeth ended up becoming queen was when her father um passed away right and there's this whole theme of like kind of strong subplot in that show about his her uncle's abdication and his unwillingness to like to be the king Mm -hmm. right and the and really like how that changed the lives of so many people and you'd be like well he just he didn't make a choice you know he he chose to abdicate but but you like but even the choice you know there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission and and i'm not i'm not weighing on whether that's sin or not i'm just saying like by by the choices we make even if it's to even if even if it's to turn the choice over to somebody else, we're still making a choice, right? Right, right. Yes. And I think he knows that, but I think he also realizes that this time of war is upon us, and maybe maybe the real choice he needs to make is to is for his son, right, who is the heir, mm-hmm. and to say, you know what, I don't, I'm not capable of of doing this myself. Mm-hmm. I'm not capable of being. The, of being a king of war, right, in wartime, but you are, right? right? So maybe he he knows that that's, that helping Gilgalad is the right call, but he himself is not capable of doing it. Mm-hmm. So in a way, maybe it's not cowardly, maybe it's it's selfless. I Well, and that seems to be Aldarion's reaction too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he's very, this is like, I feel like the most show of, humility and gratitude that we've seen from Aldarion in this whole story. Right. When he comes back. Yeah, so when he comes back. When he, when, he, when he comes back to his father after his father's read the letter, um, they, they initially kind of, Aldarion kind of starts into it like they have been. Um, and and then finally Aldarion, uh, Meneldor, uh, let's see. It says, okay, Aldarion shrugged, so they kind of have this little argument, and then Aldarion shrugged his shoulders, took a step as if to go, but Meneldor held up his hand, commanding attention, and continued, Nevertheless, the king, though he has now ruled the land of Numenor for 142 years, has no certainty that his understanding of the matter is sufficient for a just decision in matters of such high import and peril. He paused, and taking up a parchment written in his own hand, he read from it in a clear voice, Therefore, first for the honor of his well-beloved son, and second, for the better direction of the realm and courses which his son more clearly understands, the king has resolved that he will forthwith resign the scepter to his son, who shall now become Tar Aldarion the king. This, said Meneldor, when it is proclaimed, will make known to all my thought concerning this present pass. It will raise you above scorn, and it will set free your powers so that other losses may seem more easy to endure. The letter of Gilgalad, when you are king, you shall answer as seems fit to the holder of the scepter." Aldarion stood still for a moment in amaze. He had braced himself to face the king's anger, which willfully he had endeavored to, ken- ken- to kindle. Now he stood confounded. Then, as one swept away from his feet, swept from his feet by a sudden wind from a quarter unexpected, he fell to his knees before his father. But after a moment, he raised his bowed head and laughed. So he always did when he heard of any deed of great generosity, for it gladdened his heart. Father, he, a- he said, ask the king to forget my insolence to him. For he is a great king, and his humility sets him far above my pride. I am conquered. I submit myself wholly. That such a king should resign the scepter while in vigor and wisdom is not to be thought. Yet so it is resolved, said Meneldor, the council shall be summoned forthwith. So, I mean, this is like a complete 180 for Aldarion. Total 180. Right? And he's like, wow, like, I, I think he, 
And I don't think this, I don't read in this that Eldarion is like, is like, well, like, you, you know, finally you've realized that I would be a better king than you. I think he's like, well, m- maybe my father like actually really does care about, like has, has better priorities than me. Yeah, maybe, maybe I've misunderstood and misjudged him all these years. And it makes Menen- Men- Meneldor. Meneldor's action, I think, even more admirable when you realize that when um when uh blah 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 Aldarion first comes to see him, he's basically like giving his two weeks notice. He's like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. I'm leaving. I don't have a wife here. I have nothing to hold me here. All I want is my boat. Yeah. And I'm gonna leave. Yeah. Well and and I and I liken this, um you know, we, we talked about the the episode with the king of um Queen Elizabeth's uncle when he was king um, abdicating. And I, and again, I'm not like an expert on that decision. I don't, you know, I've watched the show and it doesn't paint him in a very good light. Um, and I don't mean to judge him ultimately, but like to me, that decision looked very selfish mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. It, did. it was, it basically looked like I want to live my own life and, mm-hmm. um, and I don't want to serve in this way as the monarch of this country. And it was basically like, you people can handle this, right? Um, and uh, so I contrast that. And what this makes me think of even more is um, Catholic stuff coming up, people. Pope Benedict. And when he, uh, I remember waking up that morning and being like, you know, looking at my phone and the news and everything. And it's like, Pope Benedict to resign. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. This hasn't happened in like... Like it only it's only happened once in the history of the Catholic Church that a, that a uh, that we that we know of that a pope has like resigned before his death, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And um, and he he, he resigns and and ultimately, like I think he resigned. I I've always read his resignation as a thing he did for the good of the church, right? I, for the good of um, of the church that he was the leader of, because right. he recognized in himself that there were challenges that were being that that the church was facing that he was not as capable of taking on as maybe others would be, right? And um, and you know, in this case, you have you do have people who are willing to take the job, right? You know, Maneldor has a son who he knows is willing to take the job, right? Right. Yeah. Um, especially in the in the given circumstances, he has a son that is a warrior. Right. Is a is a mariner. Is a warrior. He is not a warrior. But this is the historical circumstance they find themselves in. I think of and I think of that with with now Pope Emeritus Benedict when he was the Pope, saying to himself like, "There's so much going on, and, and I'm this guy that just wanted to retire and be a librarian, and but there are other people out there who would take this job." Right. It's not like it's not like I'm thrusting it upon a person who doesn't want it. Right. 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 Exactly. Which is what happened in the case of the king of the, you know, this Edward, king King Edward um, Mm -hmm. back in the 30s. Right. Um, Pope Pope Benedict did that, resigned, knowing that he he didn't know who was going to be pope after him. um, But there were lots of potential people. And he was like, you know, it's just time for someone else to take on these challenges. And um, so. So that's more of the spirit here with Manel, Manel doors, right. right? Like, I think he's doing this. He's abdicating for the good of Numenor mm-hmm. and for the future. Um, I see it that way. I, I think it's yeah. a, I think it's a very good and wise thing to do. Yeah, I think, it, I think it is too. I think it is too. But I love that he, you know, he kind of gives a parting shot here to Aldarion. And he's just basically like, you know, um, it may have been that things would have been otherwise if you had spoken more openly long ago. Right. Um, because here, it, you know, all Darian comes to him and basically he just wants to have a pity party, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and the king is just basically like, you know, like what we were saying, you made your own bed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this was really inevitable, but your country needs you now. And so, um, despite our differences, yes, it's true that I often sided with horrendous because we liked the same things, like our hearts leaned the same way. I've loved her. Um, but th- you know, all differences aside. So here, Men- Meneldor is willing to take that step that Aldarion was just not willing to take with his dad or with Arendis. Mm-hmm. 
right? But he's willing, Meneldor is willing to fall on his sword, if you will, for the good of his country. And that's something that neither Rendis or Aldaran were willing to do for the good of their child. Right. Well, anyways. No, it, it, boom. You got it. Um, so it's accepted. There's a little blurb in here about the council. Um, and, and you know, they, m- most of them are like, you know, push back and they don't want Meneldor to resign. But uh, one that does is Halatan, right? So who we've mentioned before and whose son will eventually marry on Kalame. And, um, and he actually, it says he had long held his kinsman Aldarion in esteem, though his own life and likings were far otherwise. And he judged the king's deed to be noble and timed with shrewdness if it must be. So Halatan does uh, judge the king to be making a wise decision here, um, uh, even though the rest of the council wants doesn't want him to. But it's the you know, I don't know that they can stop him from doing it, and um, and he's said in it anyway. And that's you know another admirable thing is that Meneldor is not somehow just doing this passive aggressive thing right here. Where he's like, you know, right. I'll resign if you don't behave yourselves. You know, right? Um, you know, he's like, I've. I've made my decision and mm-hmm. there's no going like once I've made my decision on this matter, mm-hmm. I'm not going to just, I'm never going to use resignation <laughs> as a weapon right. Right, as a political weapon, mm-hmm. like, or, or a personal weapon against my son. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, um, this is the decision that I came to realizing that it was really the best possible decision. Right. Yeah. And he did it in light of the fact that Aldarion is just wanted to leave. Like mm-hmm. he was done. So it, that's some kind of interesting to me that Meneldor kind of stuck to his guns despite Aldarion giving him basically every reason not to. Right. But he, again, was willing to see past that and be like, even, you know, even with all of his issues, <laughs> Aldarion is still better fit, is you know, more fit for this job than I am. Mm-hmm. And that takes a lot of humility. Absolutely. Because, so, I mean, honestly, I look at this, sorry, I just want to say this real mm-hmm. quick. Like, if, if I had come, like, if, if uh, I had, you know, just to maybe make this a little bit more relevant to today, if if I was, you know, the CEO of some amazing company and I had it in my mind to promote mm-hmm. someone to a job that they were maybe not expecting to get and they came in and just started giving me a hard time, right, and being like, this company sucks, I want out, you're the worst, blah, 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 I would have been like, okay, see ya, bye, you're fired. Right. You're fired. Right. You know, that's basically what Aldarion does to Meneldor, mm-hmm. right? But instead of Meneldor being like, get out of my sight, you're dead to me, he's like, here's the scepter. Yeah. Despite all that. Which I feel like was probably a good reason that Ald- Aldarion had the reaction he did. Like, he mm-hmm. fell to his knees. He's like, oh my gosh. Like, okay, I'm caught. You got me. I'm conquered. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you are the better man. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said for the you know, for the monarch, the leader who um, is is dispassionate, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and and absolutely, even even maybe when insulted, right? Yeah, uh, is doesn't, able to doesn't react in the same right. way. Doesn't doesn't have a knee jerk reaction. Is able to rise above, right? That that's yeah, that's a lot. That takes a lot of virtue. That kind of felt like. A strange like contemporary political commentary sorry i didn't mean it to be no I was no I, like... I was saying what i said <laughs> oh <laughs> not trying to make any political commentaries here people all right <laughs> that or didn't even we? occur to me <laughs> but now that you said it hmm. um okay so the end the the end of the uh narrative as we have it um ends with the last kind of the the, the loose end here of horrendous right Mm-hmm. How do we get, can we, can we get Arendis to come back and be the queen, right? Now that her husband, who she is estranged from, is going to be the king. And the short answer is they try, but she's not willing. She doesn't want to come. She's like, you can, in, you know, they, she's like, I can't keep on Kalame from you. She is the future heir, right? Right. And, uh, and, you know, <laughs> doesn't look like they're going to be having any more kids at this point. So, um, so she is you know, we're going to get a queen of Numenor for the first time. Yep. It looks like. Yeah. That's what it appears. So, yeah. um, yeah, that's, that's really how this section of the story ends, but it's not the end to the overall, to the overall story. Um, I did want to come back to when we were talking, you know, we were talking about Aldarion and Arendis earlier mm-hmm. and their relationship at this point. And there was a, there was something that was said here that I wanted to bring up. So let me see if I can remember what that was. 
Um, I think maybe it's just a general disposition of Arendus. Uh, uh, where is it? It may not. It may not be in the section when Aldarion. Oh, here we go. So she sends a letter back to the king after he asks her to come for the coronation, mm-hmm. and, and he sh- and Tarman Eldor shows it to Aldarion, to whom it seemed chiefly aimed. Then Aldarion read the letter, and the king, regarding the face of his son, said, "Doubtless you are grieved, but for what else did you hope?" He said, not for this, at least, said Aldarion. It is far below my hope of her. She has dwindled, and if I have wrought this, then back, then black is my blame. But to the large shrink in adversity? This was not the way, not even in hate or revenge. She should have demanded that a great house be prepared for her, called for a queen's escort, and come back to Armanelos with her beauty adorned, royally, with the star in her brow. Then, well nigh, all the Isle of Numenor, she might have bewitched to her part, and made me seem madman and churl. The Valar be my witness, I would rather have had it so. Rather a beautiful queen to thwart me and flout me, than freedom to rule while the lady uh, Elastirne falls down dim into her own twilight. Mm-hmm. And then with a bitter laugh, he gave back the letter to the king. Well, so it is, he said. But if one has a distaste to dwell in a ship among mariners, another may be excused dislike of a sheep farm among serving women. But I will not have my daughter so schooled. At least she shall choose by knowledge. He rose and begged leave to go. Yeah, that's basically what I was saying earlier, right? Like, she never blew up in him. She yeah. never was like, you know what? Okay, fine. I will take you back under these conditions. Boom, 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 boom. Mm-hmm. Right? I love, like, I really do love what, what Eldarion says there. She should have demanded that a great house be prepared for her. Called for a queen's escort. Come back to Armanellos with her beauty adorned. She should have acted like the queen that she was. Yeah. Or that she was going to be. And instead, it's just like she succumbed to her fate and was like, oh, woe is me. You know, like she was just content to be the victim. Yeah. And she that's just not cool. She just doesn't even seem to want to deal no, anymore. No, she doesn't. Like she's yeah. just done. And to be fair, like he's treated her like crap. Yeah. Like continually. Well, my thing is why, why doesn't he do all that stuff he just said? Like why doesn't he say like, please, baby, I will build you the biggest, the best house you've ever seen. I won't, you know, I, you're going to be the queen and, and I, yeah. I will... You know, you're gonna like they're gonna love you, and he 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 doesn't he, he doesn't try. He doesn't get effort. on one knee and be like, yeah. I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry." You know, <laughs> right. he doesn't do any of that. Here's this beautiful elven jewel, and right. you know, like let me, yeah, let me build you a mansion, and you can have all the maid servants you want, and you know, maybe he he felt like it was gonna fall on deaf ears. That's not what she wanted, and she never even asked for it because she assumed that he wouldn't want to provide. You know, I mean, it was just one big long miscommunication. Yeah. <laughs> like neither one of them we're willing to make that, to take that first step. Yeah. You know, but it makes me sad for Arendis because it's just like, you know, have a backbone. Well, it makes me sad for all of them. It makes me sad for all right. of them too. But yeah, but I, I, it could have been different. I do really think that Aldarion does love Arendis. Like, yeah. I, I think for all of his stubbornness and all of his pride, I think he really does love her. Mm-hmm. He's just, he's this dude that loves the sea. and mm-hmm. And he's also... He's. I mean, he's just also just stubborn as all get out too, you know. Yeah. So it's just like one of you need to get over it, and you know. <laughs> you know, I keep thinking that you know we keep going back to well, this was not the first offense. Like he's continually left and stayed away longer, and all the things. And I think Arendis, you know, like she did try to prevent him. You know, she did beg him to stay, um, and he went anyway. Which I mean, that's hard to take. Mm-hmm. You know, be like, okay, you love the sea more than you love me and you care about yourself more than you care about me. Like, that's that's hard to swallow. Um, but when he, but he still came back, you know? Yeah. And I kind of wonder if she had just like thrown a temper tantrum and got up all in his face and punched him and, you know, just like made his life miserable mm-hmm. for a couple of weeks. If she had done that sooner, if she could have just nipped this in the bud. You're gonna sleep in the doghouse for as yeah. long, for as for as extra long as you were gone. So for right. four years, right? And you know, like make him want to be there. Right. I mean, I understand he loves the sea, and that you know you can take the sea from the man, but not the, whatever. But you know, maybe it was. I mean, they were both in the wrong. If she had maybe made, you know, made the home more comfortable in a place that he wanted to be, mm-hmm. then he wouldn't have felt as drawn to the yeah. sea. You know, and if when he did come back at least recognize the fact, yes, he was three years late, but he still came back, you know, make his life miserable for a couple of weeks, yeah. you know, but then get over it. Stop wallowing in self-pity. 
Well, there is more. Uh, so, so we have more. We'll, we have more to discuss uh, on later episodes. You know, at least one more episode of worth of material to discuss about this story. And these are those are the notes, right? So it's not. Well, well it says the further course of the narrative, and so oh, right. so okay. this is. I think it's not. Or, it's not as organized into a coherent narrative, maybe. Um, but. But yeah, I mean, there, and there's a lot. Like, there's still a good bit, and then there's notes at the end too. Right. Okay. Um, cool. So we have more to talk about. More right to talk on. about. So we'll see. We'll see good what happens stuff. if anything ever changes for Arendis, or uh, or what. I wonder. Like, I don't know. I'm just speculating because I haven't read ahead. But um, I, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if there's any hope for their relationship. We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. All right, everybody. Uh, you Phew, can, that was a long one. It was a long one. Good. There's a lot to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, next episode will be in two weeks, and we will continue and maybe finish our discussion of Aldarion and Arendis. Uh, mailbag coming up after that. And so send your correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com or drop us a note via Tolkien Road.com. Uh, also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, and then don't again don't forget to go listen to those episodes uh, of Card Talk and Bellator Colloquium featuring uh, me or me and Greta on Card Talk. Yeah, so. yeah, do it. All right, thanks to our patrons, you all rock, mm-hmm. and especially to our uh, high tier giving patrons: Eric B, Daniel P, David B, Robert F, Chuck F, Andrew T, Ish of the Hammer, Chris L, James L, Al T, Zeke F, James A. Emilio P. Shannon S. Teresa C. Asia V. And Brian O. You guys rock. You do indeed. All of our patrons rock. All of our patrons mm-hmm. rock. And we thanks we thank everybody for listening. Indeed we do. I'll catch you next time. Yes. Bye y'all. Bye bye.